Hi, I'm Pei Rong and I'm a podiatrist at Singapore General Hospital. Today I'll be talking to you about podiatry and rheumatology. So the outline of this presentation is that I'll first go through the general podiatry principles in rheumatology patients, and then I'll follow on by an outline of podiatry interventions in specific rheumatology groups, such as rheumatoid arthritis, spondyloarthritis, osteoarthritis, scleroderma, as well as gout patients. And then I'll go through the indications for podiatry referral. I'll first show you a video on the general podiatry principles when assessing patients with foot pain. Podiatry. Ever wondered what it is? Do podiatrists just cut people's toenails and remove those painful corns and calluses of the feet? Well, not quite so. The foot is actually a pretty complicated structure with a lot of other problems too, especially since we walk on them every day. Now, what about foot pain? We perform biomechanical assessments. Here, we analyze the way you walk to determine how your gait is contributing to your foot problems. We assess the joints of your foot, your lower limb muscle strength, your foot posture and function to assess how it is contributing to that foot pain of yours and how we can help. So the foot is a relatively small but complicated structure of the body with approximately one quarter of all the bones in the body. These two feet endure up to 120% of your body weight with each step. For normal people, the foot is usually adapted to such high loads with every single step. However, for patients with systemic diseases like diabetes or inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, these systemic factors interact with mechanical factors to cause foot pain, progression of foot deformities, and even foot ulcers. So these feet do not deform overnight. For every foot deformity, there is always at least a window of opportunity to intervene. This window of time could be as long as a few years before the deformities progress to such a severe extent that they become rigid deformities. For rigid foot deformities, surgery is the only option for correction. So what types of mechanical factors could influence the progression of foot deformities? A lot of people are familiar with flat feet and think that it is a problem. However, it is not the lowered arch that is such a big problem in itself, but rather it is the excessive foot and ankle joint movements when walking which can contribute towards the progression of foot deformities. The first video is of a person walking when viewed from the back, with the bisection of the heel marked out using a line. It shows excessive heel eversion, midfoot collapse, and you can see all of the toes when the patient is walking. This type of excessive foot joint movement are more commonly known among lay people as excessive foot pronation. The second video shows both the front and the back view of a person walking and what it demonstrates is that with every step that the person takes, the right big toe is being pushed to the side during the toe off phase of walking. So, with the large amount of forces going through the foot with each step, as well as the number of steps taken in a day, such abnormal foot function can interact with systemic factors such as foot joint synovitis to eventually result in the progression of foot deformities as well as tendon dysfunction. Podiatry interventions are only targeted at the mechanical component of the foot problems in these patients. And podiatry interventions in rheumatology patients need to address the mechanical component of the foot pain while taking into account any existing foot deformity, addressing the contributing role of footwear and footwear fit towards the foot pain, 
as well as understand the limits of the podiatry intervention that is contributed by the inflammatory component of the foot pain. A prerequisite to addressing the mechanical component of the foot pain is addressing the problems of footwear fitting, especially in rheumatology patients. If the footwear does not fit the patient's foot shape and cannot accommodate any existing foot deformity, then any insole interventions will have limited effect. By footwear fit, we mean that the shoe is able to fit the width and the length of the foot, as well as have sufficient depth in the toe box region to accommodate any existing toe deformities. Only after addressing problems related to footwear fitting can we address the mechanical component involved in the foot pain through a combination of the support from both the footwear and the foot insoles. So the insoles work together with the shoes to provide the required mechanical support at the foot and ankle. But foot insoles cannot fit into every shoe. They can only fit into shoes that are deep enough to be able to accommodate the insole in the shoe, as well as those that have a removable shoe inlay. They should also be worn in shoes which have an appropriate fixation, such as straps or laces, to hold the foot properly in the shoe and ensure that the foot is in contact with the insole when walking. If insoles are not fitted into the appropriate shoes, they can cause other foot problems, such as compression of the toes, rubbing and blistering over the foot regions, or they may not work as intended. So now I'll go on to the podiatry interventions in specific rheumatology groups, starting with rheumatoid arthritis patients. Extra depth footwear has been demonstrated to reduce foot pain and activity limitation as measured by the foot function index. However, as footwear forms part of the patient's body image, compliance to those footwear is also limited by the appearance of the shoes. Clinically, it is usually very difficult to get ladies to wear those extra depth footwear as a large portion of them dislike the appearance of the shoes. Foot insoles for RA patients, when they are used with the appropriate footwear, have been shown to reduce foot pain and reduce the progression of pest planal valgus and helix valgus foot deformities in these patients. The type of insole that can be prescribed depends on the aim of the orthotic intervention as well as how much range of motion is available in the foot and ankle joints. If the foot is still flexible and can allow for correction at the subtalar and mid tarsal joints, then functional insoles, which are a lot harder, can be used to reduce any excessive subtalar joint pronation and support the arch region to reduce the risk of progression of pest planal valgus foot deformities. However, if the range of motion at the foot and ankle joints are already very limited and the foot is overall a more rigid foot type, accommodative insoles which are a lot softer, can be used to distribute plantar pressures over the foot. This can be helpful for patients with pain over the ball of the foot. Painful corns and calluses, which usually form in response to high pressure loading over a certain part of the foot, can be offloaded using insoles as described previously. This can also be done through various toe paddings or forefoot paddings. The brightman of these pressure lesions in RA patients are at the clinician's discretion. There is currently limited research on podiatry interventions for patients with psoriatic arthritis as well as scleroderma. However, clinical experience as well as evidence-based strategies for patients with inflammatory arthritis, such as RA, can be applied to patients with psoriatic arthritis. These interventions are similar to those for RA patients and involve footwear advice, insole provision, and management of corns and calluses. Furthermore, 
the skin and subcutaneous fibrosis, as well as skeletal structure changes observed in scleroderma patients can also lead to difficulties with shoe fitting, as well as the development of pressure lesions, such as painful corns and calluses over the feet. In this case, podiatry interventions involve footwear advice, debridement and offloading of the painful pressure lesions. The same framework for podiatry intervention also applies for patients with osteoarthritis, except that there is no inflammatory component involved in the foot pain. Insoles and footwear in this case are aimed at limiting or facilitating the movement of the affected foot joints. This depends on the patient's symptoms and how much remaining range of motion is available in the joints. If the remaining range of motion is very limited, then the insoles can be designed to limit movement at the painful joint. But if there is still sufficient range of motion available at the joint and symptoms are caused by jamming at the end range of motion of the joint, then insoles can be designed to facilitate the movement of the joint. For example, in first metatarsal phalangeal joint OA, and when painful symptoms are caused by jamming over the dorsal osteophytes over the first metatarsal head, then the insoles can be designed to facilitate the movement of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Insoles can also distribute plantar pressure over the foot. For gout patients, it is the first metatarsal phalangeal joint which is usually affected. Supportive footwear has been shown to reduce foot pain and activity limitation as measured by the foot function index. It has also been shown to result in a more efficient heel-to-toe gait pattern through plantar pressure analysis. Supportive shoes are those that can control excessive rear foot and midfoot movements, provide cushioning for shock absorption, and have a rocker outsole to facilitate propulsion. The top photo shows a shoe with a rocker over the forefoot region of the shoe, while the bottom photo shows a shoe with a heel and forefoot rocker. The type of foot insoles used for patients with gout are similar to the management plan for patients with OE as mentioned earlier. For patients with chronic discharging tophaceous gout affecting the feet, podiatry and management also involves wound care to keep the wounds clean and to reduce the risk of secondary infections over the ulcer sites. So the indications for podiatry referral to assess any foot pain or problems, provide foot care and footwear advice, treatment of painful corns and calluses, offloading of pressure lesions, as well as the prescription of foot insoles. And here are the references for this presentation. We would also like to thank Duke NUS Medical School for their assistance in this video.